Well, I think we're going to rock and roll because I think we have a lot to talk about here that'll be fun. Um, but let me just start off by saying, uh, in advance of talking to you, I went back. I have a lot of emails from your dad, and I have uh, a lot of letters and things that are really precious to me from through the years. And um, I had him in here a number of times. And in fact, he stayed here at the house uh, once for four or five days and a lot of long walks and restaurants and fun stuff. And uh, just, you know, uh, but I want to start by just saying that, you know, I think all of us have uh, times in our life where there's thunderbolts and we say to ourselves, what are we doing and where do we want to go and what's next and why am I here and blah, blah, blah. So just by way of personal story real quickly, uh, I was a high school band director in Illinois okay. uh, for five years at the beginning of my career. I had a good band from a very small town. And I called up John Painter at Northwestern and I said, um, I'd like to bring my wind ensemble up to uh, play for you. And then if you work with them or whatever, and then we'd love to hang out and maybe watch a rehearsal. And he said, uh, sure. He said, I'll have to charge you some money. He charged me a hundred bucks, I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> so I drug him up to Chicago a couple of hours and uh, he worked with the group which turned out to be very fortuitous because he just jumped on a couple of my kids and they wound up getting wonderful scholarships to Northwestern. Um, one of those people is the head of music education at Columbia now in New York nice. and um, Randy Alsop is his name. Anyway, he's a great alto saxophone player. Um, but after the rehearsal, I went to lunch with John and he said, oh, well, just coincidentally, we're having dress rehearsal for a concert tomorrow night in the hall. So you guys can sure come. So we went to pick Steger Hall at Northwestern. We're sitting, you know, up in the balcony. I'm sitting with all my students. And they played this piece. And I was just thunderstruck by the music. I was thunderstruck. And in that moment, I said to myself, I this is really fun doing this high school band thing and these kids can really play but they can't do that and i have to get <laughs> i have to get somewhere where i can do that yeah. and of course and it was it was the northwestern wind ensemble which in those days was all graduate students and performance just amazing mm -hmm. players and they had just returned from i believe it was ohio state where they premiered child's garden of dreams so it was the first time I heard Child's Garden of Dreams, and I never heard anything like that uh, for winds. Um, so his music has always been really, really super important to me, and I've talked to you about how much we've performed here, and I've performed around the world. And, um, but I, and I want to talk to you about that, because I know you know so much about his process and, and all the rest of it. But actually, I want to talk about you, first hmm. of all because uh, part of what we've been doing here in the midst of this crazy thing that we're in mm -hmm. is we've uh, taken time to talk to a lot of great composers and performers. Joe Schwantner was here last week and on and on, Cindy McTee, et cetera, et cetera. Marty O'Donnell, who wrote all the music for Halos, a close friend of mine from school days. But uh, part of what we've been talking about is just the road that everybody has walked. And, and when I read about you, um, I think you've carved an interesting niche for yourself um <laughs> and as a person who's a fine player and i knew about you as a player from years ago from different people in the profession um so we kind of talk about you know the the earliest memories of music and why why you chose music or if music chose you and kind of what your path was and and we're very interested in the disappointments as well as the successes <laughs> and that that's been really fun because like marty o'donnell my friend that wrote you know halo and destiny with paul mccartney and all the rest of it you know 20 years 15 years before that he was writing commercials for kitty litter in chicago you know i mean so we Which had a lot an honorable job <laughs> it is it is you know you gotta you gotta eat man so so go ahead if you would matthew just just tell us a little bit about everything about life growing up. I wanted to actually start off by saying how high regard he held you and uh, the level of musicianship and craft and dedication that you brought to um, making this music. He was, oh, thank he was, you. That's sweet. I appreciate that. Um, he, he talked to you often. Um, my earliest recollection of music uh, I, I may have related this in various contexts, but uh, it is a very distinct 
memory of dad playing the piano at the, do you know his sax, uh, saxophone sonata? Yes. Uh, there's a, a part in the, oh boy, I'm going to crap now, but the third movement where it's just a low piano going, and I was maybe four or five, just dancing around. Yeah. <laughs> and he called it monster music. And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, always music for me was a just part of life. Uh, dad had, um, uh, mom, uh, mom sang lullabies to me as a small child. I suppose that's, much earlier. Um, and from that, there are all these, it, it deeply embedded in me are the songs of um, uh, being alive of mm -hmm. ancient melodies. Uh, she sang uh, the English carols. Um, and it was this it's always been deeply embedded in me. Mm. So as I grew up, I started working for dad when I was maybe 10. I started uh, copying, you know, photocopying scores and cut and um, uh, get to send out tapes of music to uh, directors who wanted to hear it. So my, my job and the way that I learned his music really was by doing the dubbing on two cassettes. Mm. So you have cassette one, cassette two, and you have to play it to, to get it into the second one. And, and you could go high speed, which is you know twice as fast. Um, but the, I, most of the time I just listened. Mm. And you know, I've heard the you know, things like the saxophone sonata or the concerto for marimba and, ba marimba and band, mm. or you know, Child's Garden or Symphony Two. Know, dozens or hundreds of times mm -hmm. just from that process at the most or malleable part of a person's life like right. that was the music that was in my head sure and to go along with that you have all of dad's favorite composers you know Shostakovich and Beethoven and Frank and Nielsen and Patterson and um, Wagner and I didn't listen to anything resembling pop music until I got to basically college. Mm. And you know, I felt like an alien a lot. <laughs> I bet. It's like all these people had these you know, touchstones. Like we, we barely watched movies. Right. And so you know, my world was this world of art and light and music and uh, we're building something you know we, we we moved to montana when i was eight from from new york city you know i was born in new york and we moved out to montana and it was this uh, you know massive shift and all of a sudden we were i uh, was schlepping hay from one place to the other so that the horses could eat and there's so i was a a big city kid in a um, rural western town and um, feeling disconnected and it took a while i don't think i've ever truly integrated anywhere mm -hmm. but i've learned a lot of interfacing methods mm -hmm. like i've learned how to be the kind of person who is cool in places mm -hmm. and uh, maybe because of that it's taken a long time for me to feel comfortable in my own skin Mm. to get to the point where, you know, to, to embrace how deeply weird I am <laughs> <laughs> and all the stuff that I love for itself and to be able to revel in it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, like only in the last few years, like I feel like I'm starting to really, like I've baked enough. <laughs> Like I'm 37 now. Yeah. And you know, as my mom would often say, you know, good looks and talent only get you so far. Right. And 
you have to understand really deeply who you are before you can make stuff that sounds like that. Right. Right. I can emulate any style you want. Right. I can listen to it, write it down, play it, compose it, whatever you need. Uh, I'm an I'm an amazing chameleon. <laughs> uh, but uh, working on the Tenth Symphony, mm -hmm. I don't know how much background your students have. No, I think they should know that. Why don't you fill them in? This was the symphony that was underway uh, when your dad passed. Um, and we should say too, uh, for the students that your mother passed just a few months before. Uh, uh, month before. Yeah, very, very difficult time, obviously. But you decided to take up the work of completion. So yeah, please do talk about that. Uh, Dad had most of the, you know, ish about half of the symphony written. And uh, I felt that First off, I was the only one that f that I wanted to finish the piece. I, I've been deeply steeped in this music for a very long time. And I'm basically the only one who knows how to read his sketches and understand what he meant. And, um, but beyond that, there's this feeling of, we had worked so hard to get this piece off the ground. Um, it had been in the works for years and setbacks and like, uh, you know, Steve Steele was going to do it at Illinois State, like right before the chaos that made him leave. And then um, Scott Hagen was going to do it at Utah and then wasn't able to get it done for a few years. And it's like, um, and then there was another project with Onsby Rose to do an 11th symphony. And, and so he started, um, it, it was all confused and difficult. And when dad died, it was like, well, nothing is ever going it, it, to, this isn't going to work. Like, we can't make this happen. And then I took a look at what he had left and saw that it might be possible. And I said, no, uh, this is going to happen. This is going to happen now. Because if I put this on the shelf, it'll never, ever, ever get done. And I am so grateful for you and the rest of the band community that came together to help push us over the line. But working on that piece felt like graduating. You know, it was my final test. And the, the, this idea that have I been paying attention? Was I able to um, it, it was never about would I finish it the way that dad would finish it. It's would I find the heart of the music and follow it? And finding the heart of the music and following it is the core of his lesson, is the core of his understanding of the world. And I am so proud of what I did. Oh, and you should be, you should be. And, and so talk a little bit about that. You know, he talked to me about that and you know, obviously much better about how the music spoke through him and about how he wasn't a composer, at least in my experience, he wasn't a composer in the traditional sense by any means in that he felt like the music had its way mm -hmm. and that he was a, essentially a conduit. Can you, can you kind of talk about that a little bit? <clears throat> I don't know what you mean by a traditional composer. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess with him, um, I, <laughs> I remember a lot of fun times uh, when he would be with us once we came to, Mon uh, to Montana on our way to Calgary on tour. And we met him in Kalispell. And he worked with us on the third symphony. And I remember being stupid and young and saying <laughs> something to him like, you know, you write the E flat clarinet up here and the oboe up here and the piccolo way up here and then all these other guys way down there. And it's, it's, it's just so hard to tune. Do you have any advice about that? And he said, that's what it is. I wrote it like that and they can do it. 
Um, and, and, you know, it was, so the music was a thing that came out of him in a way that was uh, sacred. Mm -hmm. Less, I don't know how else to describe it. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't touch it in that respect. It was what it was. And uh, that was his process, true enough, right? He would play at the piano and play Bach chorales and sing a lot. And then he just put it to paper. Uh, the word that you use there is important, and that's sacred. Um, sacredness to me is about making a space. Mm. It's about creating the place for uh, the universe to flow properly mm. in this way and allowing it to be there. There's a, an almost a radical passivity to it mm -hmm. that... Um, you have to be open and not get in its way. Right. And we want so desperately to get in its way. Mm -hmm. um, and have you ever done any uh, shamanic work? Or, uh, read the books or doing the drumming? No. Uh, uh, did Dad ever talk to you about that process? Uh, in the deep recesses of my brain, maybe, but I couldn't tell you in detail. Uh, the, the process is very similar to a shamanic journey, mm. where in the, in the way that he understood it, in the way that he described it to me. Um, there's a book by Michael Harner called The Way of the Shaman that got him started in the late 70s. But the, the gist of it is that there's a regular drum beat about 120 beats and then you sit and then follow the drumming and you follow your breath and then you go into your internal dream space and that dream space is um wants to tell you something it's effectively your dialogue with yourself and the more you can um, be aware of your internal space the more that you can allow yourself to talk to yourself mm -hmm. the uh, the clearer and the more powerful the experience becomes mm -hmm. so dad would go into his space and um, and he would he would simply ask, "What do I need to see about the person mm -hmm. who asked who told me asked to write this piece? Mm -hmm. uh, what do I need to know? What do I need to feel?" And there would be images, um, um, a crater lake under the stars, or a bear in a house, or. Um, the, the, the great mother or, and these aren't musical things per se, right? but they would have an emotional resonance internally. They would have a, it, maybe it's best to describe this in terms of bandwidth. Hmm. Um, when we are face to face, you know, two people face to face, it's a really high bandwidth kind of communication. Yeah. There's body language, there's smell, there's um, your, uh, the inflection of your voice. You have that very you know, um, granular stuff that you're barely aware of. Like if you were going to transcribe the conversation later, it would be a dim shadow right. of what you experienced in this conversation. Right. And then to the next magnitude is this kind of internal work right. where you have this um, high bandwidth, like this multi-sensory, you know, emotional, you know, physical, psychic um, wash that you're a part of. And distilling that down to anything that resembles, you know, so, so somebody could else could look at that is... Um, it's not a real thing to do. It's like compressing 10 dimensions into three. Sure. 
Right. And so his way through that was the music. And the music is the response to those kinds of images, to those kinds of feelings, those experiences. Right. Right. Um, there's a, a, he worked in a way of generating sort of haystacks of sketches. Mm. He would, you know, like you say, sit at the piano in the morning, he would um, sing the Bach chorales, and that's his warm up to mm. get him into the space. This is now a sacred space. We have performed the ritual. Right. We created this area within which it is possible to create. Right. And then within that, he would play. Right. See what it needed to be. See and uh, poke around the sides of it. Poke around the sides. Uh, he would often say that at the beginning of writing a piece, uh, <laughs> he, he had no idea what he was doing. Right. I think that um, <laughs> and, um, mom would corroborate. Yeah, you know, he, he would often be uh, just ornery and angry and annoyed. It's like, it's like bang, like nothing's sticking. There's no traction. There's nothing. But he kept on banging his head against it. And then, so like clockwork, you 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 could never predict the day that something would click. Hmm. all you could do is know that it would click at some point right it's uh, <laughs> uh it's like a probability function that <laughs> will get there at some point so uh, how long how long did he how long every day did he sit in there and, and pound it out like that uh roughly four hours yeah like nine, nine to noon thereabouts and then at that point what did he do because um the works are so epic i mean i i don't think it's a stretch and you probably know this but i don't think it's a stretch to say that he probably wrote more wind music just in terms of runtime mm -hmm. than about anybody i can think of. I, I i don't think there's anybody else i might be wrong about that but um frank to kelly might come close yeah 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 maybe but but yeah yeah it's a lot of music yeah just the runtime alone I mean, the, you know, we did the third symphony on tour years ago, like I just mentioned, and that's like 55 minutes. Um, yeah. And the shortest one we were just about to do in Korea is 27. <laughs> that's a, for a band piece, that's a lot. That's a, a really long. So what did he do to get freshened up at noon? What, what would he do? <laughs> you know, he'd go have lunch and then he'd clean the stable or the, the, the corral. Um, my mom kept between two and eight horses on one acre. Right. And uh, he would often say that cleaning the corral, so this is, you take a wheelbarrow and you take a, a manure fork, which is you know, like a brim handle with long tines on it. And you walk around to all the horse manure and you, scrape it and you get all the dirt off of it and you put the manure in the bucket and the wheelbarrow and then you wheel that over to the pile and you put it on the pile and when you're done doing that the corral is clean right and there's sanity in tasks that are physical yeah and that have a self-evident way of saying this is done right right yeah i remember being with him right close to my home here in an italian restaurant and the phone rang mm -hmm. and it, it was your mom mm -hmm. and the horses had gotten out mm -hmm. and uh it was really fun listening to him talking to her about you know the circumstances of why the horses got out and all that sort of thing so we talked about that because i i grew up on a dairy farm i can totally relate to the yeah. whole manure story trust me <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't worked a day in my life since i left there but um yeah so why do you think um i want to bring i want to bring this uh back to you ultimately but we're kind of drifting into him here but i do want to talk about you and your what you're doing in terms of engraving and all that because i think that that's an interesting career possibility for people anyhow but so we were just engaged with the fourth symphony. Is is the fourth symphony 
the number one seller for him or how does that how does that go do you have uh, that kind one of seller is probably give us this day yeah sure yeah because the high school bands can do it and stuff yeah um, four is right on the edge of a good high school band yeah yeah um, i heard i heard a couple of high school bands played in my life yeah uh frankly um you can do nine with a high school band you yeah. just to, you know <laughs> get all your ducks in a, in a row Right, 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 right. But the Fourth Symphony, so the Fourth Symphony, um, I mean, I don't know how else to say it, and I know the students would agree. Uh, about not being able to play it on tour for the people in Korea. But it's, it, the, the ending is so powerful. I, yeah. I, I don't think there's an ending in the repertoire that's nearly as powerful as that. Um, do you know where that came from, how that, how he came <laughs> I mean, it's it's so turbulent and and it builds over such a long period of time. It's really quite astounding. My understanding of the ending of four is that this is what happens when you build up an impossible head of steam, yeah. and you are absolutely a hundred percent committed to following that all the way through. Right. Right. And it's just not done and it's just not done until it is done and even then the trumpet is hanging on for dear life saying we're not done yet come on <laughs> we're still more come on right 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 and that feeling of uh, uh, like overwhelming energy is exactly what makes dad's music powerful. Yeah. That feeling of following the truth of that, that, this instantaneous moment, understanding where you are here and then needing to go to the next moment. Right. And it's not about form or like a formal structure. It's not about a, uh, some kind of a plan in that way. It's about feeling the truth of the moment and living there. Right. So while he's writing, like, he is feeling the truth of that moment and going, no, this needs to go. This right. needs to keep, this needs to, like, ha, uh, and then figuring out the the technical way to realize the, the truth of the moment. Yeah. So he was an incredible technician. Yeah. Like, the, and people who are less familiar with his music in the 60s and 70s uh, would be surprised to see just how uh, uh, complex and intricate the music was back then and how uh, his language shifted from deeply chaotic to like, grounded tonality, like, um, barely functional tonality but it's almost like um, uh, Jackson Pollock was an incredible portrait painter right. you, you, you have to have the technique before you can you know or maybe it's like a, uh, putting the railroad tracks down as the railroad as the train's coming but building your technique along with the music allows to to, to come to a truly powerful combination of your intuition for the needs of the moment and your capacity to um, make it reality, to execute right. it properly. You know, he, um, his journey that way a little bit mirrors a lot of composers who probably, I suppose to a degree, his academic training, which was more, uh, I would assume, kind of the serial construct that they were doing back in those days. And so many people, you know, contemporary composers, and we've talked to a number of them, uh, Cindy McTee and, you know, et cetera. They kind of kick that to the curb, but I think that the discipline of it mm. is what has enables him to be such a, a detail-oriented, finely tuned craftsman of the piece, even though, again, there's enormous energy there. There's still great detail. That's the thing. That, that's uh, his um, and that and that training comes into play more often than you would expect. Yeah, because that then becomes a textural 
component that yeah. you know, when you need to express something where you know the world is coming unhinged at the seams that uh, chaotic language is really useful to be able to describe it right and it's a uh, and, and if you're limited in that way then it never gets as weird or dissonant or crunchy as it should to fully explore that place did he ever did he ever write something big and then just say nah and just pull it and not release it to your knowledge i'm just curious about that uh his uh, it's less about pulling it and more about maybe it just never happened. Hmm. Um, so there are a couple of things. There's his uh, first symphony. Um, and then there's another piece called Double Image, huh. uh, which is for two orchestras, which was his uh, doctoral thesis, maybe? Uh, uh. Master's doctor or something, something young. Um, but it is borderline impossible to play. <laughs> Not just from a forces perspective, but from a coordination. It is like straight nuts, top to bottom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet. Uh, but there's a piece that I'm working to get off the ground called Death and the Maiden, which is an oh. opera he wrote in oh, wow. 1978 based oh, on a huh. story by Ray Bradbury about um, an old woman who meets death and gets one perfect day. Wow. And a beautiful story. And I'm looking forward to being able to get it produced. We have permission from the Bradbury State. But yeah, okay. So you, you traveled with him quite a bit growing up. And mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, you run around and you hear you help groups perform his music and, and coach him up and give him insight. Mm -hmm. What, in your opinion, constitutes a, a great performance of your father's music? When I'm not anxious. <laughs> uh, oh, because you think it's going to crash, you mean, or you think so? Well, there's a there's a level of confidence that needs to be there. Yeah. There, uh, I get anxious when I don't know if they're going to be able to make it. Or there's a, like we're coming up to the part, like the tenor saxophone is not strong. And uh, okay, are you kind of doing it? <laughs> but it, like, feeling that kind of, uh, unsettledness I think uh, detracts from the music and always with better players uh, you know you have the possibility of a better performance um, but you know I'd rather hear um, you know, less skilled players do a passionate thing sure than skilled players kind of knocking out some notes right, uh, right. so so that's that's the negative reaction side of it like i i want to feel comfortable mm. that the music is happening but that's maybe bare minimum <laughs> what makes a great performance is the uh, when the communication inside the group is effortless yeah when people are looking at each other, when the, they are paying attention to what they're doing, they're, they're playing, dad's music is a combination of little ensembles. It's mostly chamber music and some big stuff. Mm. And every one of those rapidly shifting chamber ensembles need, like, needs to be its own thing. Mm -hmm. They have to have a, a dialogue within themselves where th the music can come through. Right. And I talk a lot about how the, 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 the energetic character of the moment of music needs to be honest. Right. And you may take that as a fundamental. That's, sure. um, without that, the whole thing falls apart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the things that I invariably say to every group 
play exactly what's on the page. Right. Uh, play the right tempos. Play the markings. It, they're correct. Right. We worked really hard on that. Right. Right. <laughs> Not just from, you know, you know, dad did it right the first time, and then I made sure they were right on the page. Right. Yeah, I remember uh, just a real quick story that he came in, I brought him in uh, when we did the Fourth Symphony years ago, uh, mm -hmm. 25 years ago, one of the first times. And the timpani, as you know, are very important to him in that piece because mm -hmm. of the cannon fire of Lincoln's passing, et cetera, et cetera. So the timpanist is where I always have the timpanist and he's wailing away and he's, he's out in the hall and he kept saying louder, timpani, louder, 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 and it just wasn't enough. So he literally moved the timpani to the lip of the stage and for the performance too, because he wanted cannon fire and we weren't giving it to him. I'll never forget that. That was a very vivid lesson of him saying, no, this is exactly what I meant. It's, it's like, a tim who cares if anybody hears anything else? It's the timpani. <laughs> Art is in large part about deciding what's important yeah. and then doing everything in your power to make that thing important. Right. Um, dad's music also gets to extremes right and those extremes are where the music is right. very 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 loud very 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 soft mm. very fast very slow mm. the middles are much less interesting yeah and so the louds, you know, we're always concerned as educators that we don't want to get an uh, in instructor to have a bad sound. Right. And, or, and, and we want to be able to, 95% of music is in your comfort zone. Right. So it makes sense to train for that comfort zone so that you're able to get a good sound from a piano to a forte so that you can have good control, that you can uh, be able to be a, a good productive member of society right right and then uh, the more interesting and useful training is how do you live at those extremes and still and don't shred your face right um how do you uh, produce at the edge and ride the razor <laughs> so that it doesn't tip over into so it, you live in buzzsaw, but not shredded. Right, right, right. That's a great way to put it. What a great way to put it. So, so speaking of that, what was it like to go to college? You went to Michigan State and Indiana and some great schools um, and play your dad's music in an ensemble. How was, what was that feeling like? You know, the weird thing? They almost never programmed it. Is it because of you, you think? I think so. I think <laughs> there might have been some kind of, uh, like, we don't want to show favoritism or... Oh, weird. I, uh, and, and we were always kind of mystified by this. I mean, we did a, a couple of things here and there, and it was perfectly reasonable. Um, you know, uh, but it never felt like uh, we're celebrating... The fact that I'm here, it's uh, we we need to make sure that we are looking above board about everything. That's so funny. That's yeah. so funny. Or maybe they were worried you'd be on the phone calling him and saying, "You should hear what they you did know, at the tempo." <laughs> it, there's so much fear around interacting with him. Yeah, I don't know why that would be. No, but yeah. Um, and I get the I now now that I'm in an analogous position. I feel the same kind of thing. Hmm. There's a, a fear of looking stupid yeah. and of having your authority usurped yeah. by you know, the voice of God. Right. right. And, and so for a lot of directors, that's a, for all that you can, you say that you want to be involved with composers, for all you can say that you want to uh, do the right thing, there's it, who you are as a person really affects how you deal with that. Yeah. That's fascinating to me only because he was about the least threatening human being I've ever met in my life. 
you know, physically, <laughs> but uh, emotionally and mentally, uh, he would put you in a place that is deeply, deeply uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, you had to, you had to be on your toes. There's no question about that. But not in a, I never felt, no, ever the projection of power or anything like that. No, no, the the his power came from stripping away your defenses, right, and requiring you to be honest and um, deeply yourself. Yep. And engage with this directly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's the scariest goddamn thing ever. Right. 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 You know, you can deal with a tyrant. Right. <laughs> Who cares? I mean, right. fine. I mean, it, it sucks, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, but how do you deal with a holy man who, <laughs> uh, who requires you to come up to him, and right. come up to his level? Right. Right. Yeah, he just, he had a way, you know, a couple, three different times I can remember of him standing in front of the group and telling him, you know, the stories of the, of the visions and the inspirations. And I'll just be totally upfront with you, Matthew. I remember one time standing behind him and he's talking about getting sucked into the eye of a newt and there's a snow covered bear running up a mountain. And, and you know how he would talk with his hands like this and kind of close his eyes. And I was standing behind him. I'm just thinking where I come from, they lock people up like this. I mean, I, <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, and mostly I'm thinking, what do my students think? Oh my gosh, what, my, what, they, what are they thinking right now? And what they would think would show up in the performances, which were ridiculous. Yes. Ridiculous. Every time that he came and stood in front of the group, whether it be that day or the next day or on tour or whatever, they were just lit up. I, yeah. was just along, I was just along for the ride. I just tried to start him and stop him, you know? It was... <laughs> you know, the, the, so there's a, um, a phenomenon that happens. If you, I play euphonium and trombone. Right. Uh, you can see one behind me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if you, uh, every once in a while when I'm teaching uh, a younger student, um, you know, they'll have trouble hitting a particular high note. Right. If I take their instrument, and then play that note, like pure, clean, fairly loud, and then hand that instrument back to them, it comes out straight away. Right. It's like I set up the, the sympathetic vibrations in the instrument and in their minds. And it's the same way with dad and the ensembles. Right. It was, it, this is the pure crystalline form of the energy that produced this music and that is a pure distillation of the nature of reality. Right. And you can't help but be changed by being around it. Right. right. It's like a seed into chocolate that tempers it. Right, right. And uh, when you are with a group day in, day out, um, it's, you know, you're doing important work. Right. But it's hard to have that kind of crystallization. Right. And bringing in someone like Dad or you know, the the very fine composers that you have can really help shift. Oh, okay, that's the place. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the the clinician effect, where you know they'll come in and say the same goddamn thing you've been saying for three months, and then all of a sudden they go, "Oh, I should play in tune." Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> maddening. It's good. But good. I mean, it's familiarity breeds contempt. I mean, that's just, that's just life in the big city. So I want to get back to you a little bit. So tell, tell us a little bit about um, this whole notion of engraving music and how you sort of leverage that mm -hmm. to do video game work and Shazam and some of the many things you've done. I think it's an interesting, cool uh, thing. So it turns out that music notation is really interesting. There's a whole world in there. Uh, when I was in middle school, my band director had a copy of Finale 2. And I, 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 I was in his office one day and he showed me two, uh, he, he put in an eighth note and then he put in another eighth note and it automatically beamed them together. And it looked like music. And at that moment I went, holy shit, that's amazing. 
and you know, I got the software, brought it home, and started learning. And Dad gave me a couple of projects to do. Uh, first thing was uh, a vocal piece. There's a piece called Black Dog Songs and Horn Sonata, and I, uh, it was it was fantastic, and I took to it like a duck to water. Did it all the way through college. Uh, so getting into the music business is in large part a series of happy accidents based on, um, how about if you want to get hit by lightning, plant a lot of lightning rods. So this is, uh, that's a Nicholas Nassim Taleb concept, um, Black Swan that you want to invite positive randomness and guard against negative randomness. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I got to, so dad had studied with Elsa Verdere, uh, the clarinetist at Michigan State University. And when I um, went to Michigan State, he had suggested that I look her up, say hi. And I'd mentioned that I'd been into the uh, music notation land. And she had a David Diamond trio that she had done with her husband and uh, their, their pianist that they needed redone. And so I took that and I sweated it. I sweated it hard. And I did, and, I, and I'm very proud of that work. And on the back of that, uh, several years later, I put that as uh, one of the samples on my website. A person contacted me out of the blue and said, hey, I want to learn Sibelius. I'm uh, getting into orchestration. This guy turned out to be uh, Mike Feingold, who was a guitarist for Erica Badu for many years. And he was uh, you know, into... And, and so I gave him lessons for um, about a year. And then all of a sudden he said, hey, my buddy is, uh, just became music director over at Bungie. Now I'm talking about Destiny here. And um, I recommended you as a copyist. And that started three years of learning a lot of ropes of you know, I had I'd done a lot of theater work and I'd done a lot of um, various other things, but I'm going to follow this particular chain. So, <laughs> um, Dad to Elsa Verdere, David Diamond, Mike Feingold <laughs> to uh, Sky Lewin, who is the <laughs> music director at Bungie. So, started working with him and um, Mike and I were uh, figuring out our jobs as we went along. He was a passionate WC fan, um, but sure, we can do video game stuff. You know, I'd done a lot of theater work. I'd done a lot of classical work, but I didn't really understand the video game land, but fine, we'll make it happen. And so uh, we took a lot of pay cuts. <laughs> but, uh, or, or, or accepted low pay at the front for way, way too much work. But we built this relationship. We built a relationship with Sky. We built a relationship uh, with the, the people in Nashville doing the studio work. And I built a relationship with um, uh, Black Ribbon. Uh, so this is Matt Franco's shop out in uh, Colorado. Uh, Matt Franco is a ex uh, Joanne K Music Services, um, who is a, one of the major um, LA uh, copy shops who do most of the movies. So Matt was um, printing my uh, dad's music for Massalonica Press for a lot of years. So he was familiar with my work. But when I started working at Bungie and uh, I started getting a bunch of higher profile gigs, like I got a Gwen Stefani Christmas album out of nowhere. Wow. Um, because Mike knew the her, her music director from his time in Popland, <laughs> and it was like, 
uh, the uh, you know Matt said, "Hey, come work for me. I'm doing a lot of um, I'm, I'm, you're starting to step on my toes, and uh, you are going to have a much better time working for me rather than competing with me." Mm. And he was absolutely right. Yeah. And mostly because I purely loathe doing paperwork. Right. And most of administration. So by the time we were up to Destiny 2 and the second release, like I was running, you know, six or eight people to get the thing done and not sleeping and getting really sad. <laughs> and I went, you know what? I don't want this. Yeah. This hurts and I'm not getting paid enough for it to hurt like this. Yeah. And so I, I, I transfer all my accounts over to black ribbon. And I said, you know what? You take care of them. I will just do the work. Right. And so he started, you know, sending me really cool jobs. Mm. I, a bunch of high profile movies we did. One of the things that was really cool was the Disney was putting out a uh, a, live, a picture to orchestra arrangement of Mary Poppins. Hmm. So you'd have the dialogue and uh, sound effects on screen, but the music would be done by the orchestra. Hmm. And so they needed a new score and they needed a set of parts. And so I got to work with the original um, manuscript for Mary Poppins and then the original uh, separate sound recordings. And it was, it, I grew up on this movie and then to hear that yeah. by itself was one of those, yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so the, the moral of the story here is not just to uh, be friends with cool people, but that helps a lot. It's when you get an opportunity, knock it out of the goddamn park. Right. The, you, uh, it helps if you are professional, which is to say, um, good to work with. If you have to be amazing to overcome being an asshole. Yeah. Uh, but if you are good to work with, being very good is fine. Mm. Uh, if you get back to people on time, if you um, do what you say you're gonna do, right. it, uh, people are much, much happier to recommend you and to work with you again. Right. Yeah, you said another thing I thought that was really key, and mm. you probably didn't even realize it. You said when you wanted to do the thing, you, you took a pay cut. You didn't take a pay cut, but you accepted work yes. you know, way, way down the food chain because you knew, it, it seems to me, you knew where you wanted to go. Yeah. But you were totally willing to bite the bullet up front. And I, I think that's really pertinent advice for a lot of the students you're talking to because, you know, they're graduating and going into this crazy world right now. And um, just to be patient, to not hold out for the money, but to think about the thing and the place you want to be X number of years from now. And that might mean sacrifice up front. That's kind of what you did, sounds like. Yeah. Uh, building an ecosystem is more important than the payout right now. Exactly. You have to eat and you have to be treated like a human. Right. Uh, so there are certain things that we you will that you shouldn't take because right. they're exploitative right um this this is such a strange time um your greatest resource are your colleagues here yeah um, and building good relationships here will spread networks that you don't even know exist right Right. Um, and one of the great gifts that dad gave me is 40 years of goodwill. Right. He was infallibly pleasant. 
Yeah, exactly. No, it, I, I agree. Always good to work with. Yeah. And every time he showed up, it was way better than when he didn't. Yep. Yep. And so that's why he got called back. Yep. And you saw that. Yeah. You saw that. That that imprints. That's something that's inside of you now, for sure. Well, I want to remind the students, you have opportunity here to talk to, obviously, for a whole bunch of reasons, and not just DNA. <laughs> the, world's, uh, the world's leading authority on the music of David Maslenka. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, these, these uh, students, you know, I've, I've told you how many billion times I've done the piece. These guys are really ready to kill it. And they, uh, they loved it. Um, so this is your chance. Uh, you, who's moderating? Hey, Chris, who's moderating? Are you moderating? I am today, Professor. Corey's moderating. There's, Corey. There's a picture of Corey. For those of you that forget what Corey looks like, there's a picture of him. Um, so, Sorry, my, uh, my internet's been a little slow. No worries, no worries. So uh, if you can, oh, by the way, Matthew, Corey is a euphonium player. Don't hold that against him. Um, we'll, we'll manage. <laughs> You've got the beard for it. That's right, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, while they're sending questions to Corey, and they will be sending questions to Corey, did you hear that embedded threat there? Um, <laughs> what... Um, do you have uh, pieces of music of your father's that you think deserve more attention? I asked that for me. I'm leading with a question. What doesn't get played as much that you think is, that was a particularly great are, um, Astonishing that don't get enough play. Uh, that is nine, Symphony Nine, and uh, a Carl Sandburg reader. These are, I think, the future of what dad was going toward. I'm getting a pencil. <laughs> Good. That's helpful. And part of the reason that they are not played very often is that nine is an hour and 15 minutes long. Yeah. And it's mostly three people playing. Right. <laughs> right. But what it does do is extraordinary. Yeah. Um, and uh, is there a good recording of that on the website or good? Um, Steve, uh, Steve did a great one. Oh, great. Uh, that's Steve Steele from Illinois State University. I know Steve. Yeah, absolutely. This is for the benefit of your students. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, then uh, Alex, uh, sorry, um, a, uh, a Carl Sandburg reader is this beautiful songbook, it's uh, deeply American mm. in, 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 in character in a way that explores the nature of hardship, of heartbreak, and trying to make it in a place that's not very friendly. Mm. And I think that's his most Copelandy kind of vibe. Yeah, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful piece. Yeah, um, I don't think it, personally. I don't think three gets enough play. Well, you're absolutely right. Three is uh, maybe the most audacious opening to any band piece ever. And that and that's why people. I think people discount it just because of that, which is stupid. But that that opening is so ballsy. It it, it is. A C major scale in whole notes, and it goes up, and, and then comes down. <laughs> like you get explodes. Yes, yeah. and but that opening sets up a question in your mind. Yeah, why would you do that? Right, and then he proceeds to answer it for the rest of the symphony. It, I, I personally, uh, just in terms of the works I've done, I've done a lot of them. I. I think it's some of his best writing in three. That's amazing. It's brilliant. It's just brilliant. It's taxing, but it's brilliant. So well, why else do you get out in the bed in the morning? Right. <laughs> well, and, and I think that's one of the reasons that, you know, especially college students like his music so much. They like it because of the of the scale. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like playing Mahler. It's it's not 
it's not something you get to do in wind band. You play five minute, five and a half minutes, and you're off the hook. Sure. Um, but not not with his music. He doesn't let you off the hook. Um, yeah, it, it's always a there's there's such a stark difference in culture between the orchestra world and the band world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the orchestra world is training for professional life, the band world is training for educational life. Right. And so orchestral land, you are it, it's necessary to play the standards. So you can get your teeth into Beethoven and Mahler and Shostakovich and all those guys. Right. And there's this rich, abundant ecosystem, again, that word, of, of, of beautiful music that you can pull from. Right. And in band world, there is that there too. But we are trained in band land to go for five minute marches. Right. Uh, or um, a, a fanfare or, or, or a three minute tune. Uh, yeah, there... I often wonder, I often wonder, <laughs> I mean, he's, he, he's probably writing, especially Symphony 3, I have to say, well, even Child's Garden to that, for that matter. And he's saying, okay, I'm writing a 53 or 55 minute piece of, of, of uh, music here. Why on earth did these guys play it? I, I wonder about the, if there was any fear or trepidation on his part. I've always wondered that when he's writing these gigantic, massive scale works to, to send out to this market. I, I don't think he ever thought about it in terms of market. Yeah. Um, for all his qualities, he was not a businessman. Yeah. Um, what he thought of very specifically was the person he was writing for and the group he was writing for. And that was his whole focus. Yeah. And certainly earlier on, there was, um, especially for Symphony Three, the, the the conversation with him and Gary Green was, um, yeah, it should be fifteen minutes. Well, it looks like it's going to be a little longer, friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, when I talk about finding the truth of the music he never sets out to write an enormous piece he sets out to write the music that needs to happen yeah yeah and and yeah that causes some problems yeah it's it's way more expensive to produce a long piece you know just from the copying alone um you know yeah, it's a whole, it's an exercise in the necessary. Right. Right. And when you have something that is compelling, you'll figure out a way to do it. Right. Right. And that was always his perspective. Right. Like, this has to be this way and you'll get it done. Right. Right. Well, I just got a message that uh, Corey, who was moderating discussions, internet just went down. This makes our first official technical glitch in nine weeks on this call. Um, so could you guys just send questions directly to Chris, I guess? Chris, are you moderating now? Hello, Chris. Maybe Chris is talking to Corey. Hi, He's Chris. in the chat. Oh, great. I got it. Great. Okay, guys, I don't want to keep uh, Matthew too much longer here. So if you have questions, uh, let's do it or just post them real quick. That'd be great. Since we lost Corey, maybe your questions were sent to him and he, his internet died and he fell off the end of the earth here. So anything from anybody? Uh, yeah, I got a question I can ask on behalf of a student. I'm Chris, by the way. Um, good. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, so the question from the student is, uh, do you compose yourself or uh, what advice has made you a better player uh, being so often exposed to your father's compositions? I do write. Um, I have a, a handful of band works and some chamber music. Um, I just wrote a euphonium quartet. Uh, what has made me a better writer, better player,
what I'm in the process of writing, uh, setting aside the time every day of making the space. We talked about the sacred space earlier. And it's a really helpful construct to do. There's no necessarily a religious connotation to it, although it works in that, that way as well. But the having the boundary, not just of the start, but of the stop of saying, you know, I'm going to be here for four hours or I'm going to be here for two hours and whatever happens happens. And if nothing's happening at two hours, I can go do something else. Or if I'm in the thick of it, I can go for as long as I need to go. But there's, it's like giving yourself permission to be present. Um, it works for, for performance as well. This is my practice time. I'm going to start here. I'm going to do my warm up, and that warm up gets me in the mind space to play. It gets my body in the place where it's comfortable playing. And then, you know, I work on this stuff. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know, this is maybe a side point, but uh, the most useful practice technique I ever learned was start from the back and then go. So uh, start on bar 312, get that great, and then do bar 311, 312. And the further you go back, uh, the, uh, by the time you get to the end of the piece, that's an old friend. It's, it's so often you start from the top and you get halfway through and you go, Oh, that's shaky now. Uh, but that works great for, um, memorization as well. But it's a, it's one of those techniques that I wish I had learned a lot earlier. So yeah, set some boundaries for yourself, honor them and don't allow people to disturb you while you're in that place. Turn off every single device that makes sound. Uh, block your roommate. Uh, uh, do whatever you can so that all that's happening is you engaging with the material, whether it's writing or performing. That's super <laughs> solid advice, Matthew. It's great. Uh, okay, we have another question uh, from John Newman. Uh, John, you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Sorry about that. Um, so Professor Salzman mentioned a few times that um, David Maslanka's music uh, is considered minimalism. And uh, I just, uh, I, I definitely see how that happens. But can you uh, expand on that? Like how he takes such minimalistic music, but expands it to such a grand scale? I, I just have to edit. I, I don't consider his music to be minimalism. I said it has minimalistic. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I was going. Yeah, with. yeah, yeah. thanks. <laughs> this is so the, the, the fundamental idea of minimalism as a, as a concept is to use as few materials as possible to get the most benefit. And it's being efficient and frugal. And the, what it does is force you to look very closely at the nature of what you're doing. Boil it down to what is its essential character? What is this essential texture quality? And from there, it's like looking at a dot on the wall that as you look at it long enough and it expands into the whole universe. Like this is a, uh, a fundamental conception of reality is the interaction between feedback loops and chaos and that you have um, you know, one thing interacts with another thing and then that in turn interacts with the first thing. And you build up these swirls and you have these areas of stability and you have these boundary layers between the areas of stability and the, the rest of the universe. Um, this quality of minimal writing 
is about focusing very closely on a few particles and how they interact. And all of a sudden, they feed back on each other and then they become necessary. They become their own reason for being. They become, you find those areas of stability that are, where, that's where the music lives. That was fantastic. That was fantastic compositional device. I hope you're taking notes. <laughs> it's really a, a great, I was gonna ask you to give compositional advice to these guys. You just did it. That was beautiful. Okay, thank you. We have a question from uh, Stacy. Uh, Stacy, are you on? You wanna ask your question? I'm coming on, there I am. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, Let's see, well, I had kind of two very divergent thoughts. One of them, I'm just wondering as a um, copyist with the music and that if the fact that, at least I know in my community bands, more people are reading their music on um, a tablet instead of on a printed page, if that has affected maybe the way that you're doing your um, copy editing or, or the way you think about that. Mm -hmm. I've actually been uh, wrestling with this one recently. The, when I produce music for Maslanka Press, I do a nine by 12 sheet because I love the beauty of the size. It's, it's, a, it's a three by four ratio, it feels right. It's, and, and I have inset margins like the medieval um, book so that you have a one, um, so that the spread of pages you have one image that is two, two columns on one broad sheet. Mm -hmm. uh, when you break that into only seeing one sheet at a time, that aesthetic is lost. And so I am interested in, um, this, is, this, is, this, this then comes to necessity, right? So I have my aesthetic necessity of, like, I love the way that things feel and, and look, and I want to make sure that on every device or every medium that people interact with this, that they're having the highest character of, of experience possible. So does that mean that I do three times the work and produce scores that are optimized for single sheet and for printed? And for, so, uh, produce eight and a half, eleven sheets so that people can print it by themselves easily, and an A4 sheet for my, my European colleagues, mm -hmm. and the nine twelve that we do in house, and then do even margins on the printed sheets. So because I can't guarantee that they're going to have the the right page turns, <laughs> or they might be looking at it on a tablet. Um, that's where I'm leaning. It's so much more work, <laughs> but. <laughs> But I, it's uh, these are the nice extras that when I get certain elements of stability going, then I can do the next uh, version and then make that better. But my overall goal is to make sure that everybody's experience with this music is um, all about the music and not dicking around with page turns. <laughs> Very, very cool. I, yeah, I, uh, page turns are an interesting thing. <laughs> they have the whole uh, page turns, queuing, and navigation are where most people fall down when they're preparing parts. So uh, maybe this is good advice for. Um, so let me turn on a light over here because it's getting a little dark for me. Um, when you're preparing music for performance, the most important thing is that everybody can find where they are at the same time. Um, uh, sort of the basics still apply. You need to have, you know, all the parts need to have exactly what's in the score. The page turns need to be right so that when they are printed as booklets, people aren't fumbling with them as they close. That means to have on the lower right hand side of uh, odd numbered pages, you need at least two or three seconds of rest, if at all possible. And if it's not possible, then you spread it out into an accordion sheet. So you have three sheets or four sheets 
and then you, but that must be in your mind as you're making parts. Navigation. I like bar numbers on every bar and rehearsal marks that are bar numbers. What happens is when you have rehearsal marks that are bar numbers, you can simply say 34 and you, everybody starts there. Um, and maybe more importantly, when you're in performance and you all get lost, you can look around and go, <laughs> and everybody knows that that was probably a rehearsal mark. Uh, so the combination of bar numbers, rehearsal marks, will get you a long way to having a successful performance. Cues, if you are in, if you have longer than 20 bars off, depending on how fast the piece is or how exposed the entrance is, give a cue. Uh, put something in the part that says, all right, the symbol is gonna come here now. So you can track into that. It must be audible. If, you can, if it just looks like it might be a good cue on the computer, uh, it may not help. Good cues are things that a person can hear. It may not be the most prominent line, but you know, the oboe can probably hear the English horn a lot better than they can <laughs> hear the, you know, the saxophone or whatever. Someone, you, you, someone sitting next to someone uh, playing a prominent line is the best cue. And then it devolves from there. Uh, so with those things, you can probably, you know, shuffle your way through most of it. Sorry, one more. Aesthetic choice. <laughs> uh, if you can possibly help it, have the, the, the basic key to a good looking page of music is to have the shortest duration be roughly the same spacing on every page. So if the dominant spacing is eighth notes, that eighth note should be roughly that width apart everywhere. If the dominant is 16th notes, that should be it. What this will do is create an even page color and an even, um, that is to say the even ratio between light and dark on the page. So you don't have a really light page and a really dense page, you want to have an evenness to it. Um, once you achieve that, making sure that you have even spacing uh, all the way throughout, that the we read rhythms through spacing and then through, and then we are confirmed in that rhythm reading through the actual flags and, and beams. So, 16th notes need to be a little shorter or closer together than eighth notes in a consistent way. You know, and it's not um, uh, geometric, it is logarithmic. So it's a little bit more, not twice as much. The, a whole note doesn't take four times the space as a quarter note. It takes like a, you know, two and a half spaces. And um, consistency will save your life. <laughs> uh, I'll, I, I really appreciate all that because um, my hobby for oh so long since I was a kid is as a calligrapher so that whole aesthetic that you're talking about with spacing and 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 everything in addition to that well for me coming to look the readability and all of that it, it's it's fascinating to see the connection yeah of all of that like all of your downstrokes need to be the same width <laughs> Yes, yes. And all of your uh, counters need to have the same amount of weight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. We're in related lives. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how often um, fonts and everything find their way into other, other worlds. <laughs> yeah. uh, wow. Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks for your question. Well, Chris, are there more questions that we got them all? Uh, I don't have any other students uh, with uh, questions unless anyone wants to do one last minute. I don't have anything else. Okay. Well, Matthew, I can't thank you enough for your time and um, just a really interesting look into, you know, your dad and, and yourself and your own career path and how that's all developed. I think it's, you've shown a lot of um, 
survivability on entrepreneurship and <laughs> seriously and and to to the path that you've chosen and the things that light you up and we'll get you out here one of these days um I'll look forward that, to it yeah it'd be fun and uh, i'm going to give a good hard listen to symphony number no. nine so uh yeah well thanks thanks buddy i appreciate it a lot well i'm glad to be here and thank you for your questions and for your kind attention yeah i love talking about this <laughs> I can tell. I can tell. It's neat. Everything I've heard is true. So <laughs> <laughs> all the bad stuff too. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, Especially well, the bad. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. And you stay safe and um, all the best to you and stay in close touch. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Um, you we'll see you guys.